It's not a bird, it's not a plane, it's Superhero Slate. It's a modern podcast where we talk about everything that's great. Like movies, TV, superheroes. It's Superhero Slate. Oh yeah. Hello everyone and welcome to Superhero Slate, the show where we run down the latest superhero entertainment news. We love TV, movies, and superheroes, so let's talk it all out. My name is Chris. And my name is Mike. And this week we're putting on our dancing shoes for Venom 3, The Last Dance trailer that debuted this week. Are these shoes that we lace up or are they slip-ons? They are um, goo. They're, they're Venom shoes. <laughs> so goo shoes. They're goo shoes. So yeah, so that way you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't slip because they got traction. You, know, you don't want to fall um, down. And, uh, it's like those um, cloudy with a chance of meatball uh, spray-on shoes. Exactly. You, you're, you're very safe with these, so you're going get, to get those on. Um, pretty early on, we got some rumors about World War Hulk being in the cards at Marvel, Mike, and, and we, we might, we've talked about this before, but we've got some pretty, pretty good stuff, uh, lined up for this rumor here. Uh, uh the X-Men reboot might get a horror director, and I'm going to just go ahead and drop it, they, they met with Jordan Peele, but that could also be an indicator of something bigger and, and more. Yeah, Chris and I are feeling, I would say, very efficient today. I made it early to our recording session. I feel like I'm almost always five minutes late. There's this phenomenon that happens, Chris, where uh, 15 minutes before we say we're going to hop on mic and start recording, that 15 minutes goes like five times faster than any other 15 yeah. minutes in my life. And I know there's like, there's no, there's no punishment. There's no, um, you know, there's no negative, like, Indication I'm docking your pay you're... every time. Every <laughs> yeah, there's, you're no, late. there's no pay to be docked. But I swear, those 15 minutes just like evaporate. I'm always like, ah, oh, behind. But like, I, I'm early. I feel like we got to uh, we got to recording here quickly. So let's see what this does to the show. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, and it's also earlier in the day than usual. Uh, I mean, just just to be honest, um, I will I will say if anyone was watching live, I accidentally cut off our intro a little bit, so I'll have to edit that in for the audio version. But um, but yeah, we're we're earlier in the day for you at least. Uh, you know, three hours behind. But this is a good time to go ahead and tell people we will not be here next week. We were we were taking our summer vacation uh next week so we will not have an episode next week but we have 400 plus 477 news episodes and what 100 review episodes people can go listen to in in the meantime so uh, yeah go listen to some old news that'll really really get get you going i don't sometimes it's kind of fun to check in and see how silly we were how wrong we we were sure was going (laughs) exactly oh my god i don't think i could stand listening to us talk uh early 2020 like just mm-hmm. before the pandemic changed the entertainment in Hollywood oh, yeah. uh, forever. Oh, I don't, uh, how how delightful we were coming off of uh, Avengers Endgame. Yeah, that I I, I dared even go back because we started around when uh, you know the first Ant Man and Age of Ultron came out. I I would hate to see like what what news were we getting then, right? Like how how much has that changed? But uh, mm-hmm. uh but yeah, anyway, got a long ways to say. You know, we'll we'll, we'll be off next week. So uh, if you guys have uh, any summer plans or whatever enjoy them uh, take, take a take the extra hour we'll give we'll give you back your hour as they say in the corporate yeah. mic yeah this is a, this is a zoom meeting uh but make sure you come back in two weeks because chris will be able to give you a recap of his yeah. trip to come out and visit me yes. in so, los angeles it, we're it, going to go to disneyland and he's going to be able to see avengers campus for the first time i'm very excited about this and it's really ironic because we only record when we're not together uh and we 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 uh um, we even though we'll be together in the most like I guess the ideal podcast situation, we're not going to record because we're going to be everywhere else. So <laughs> honestly, I don't even know how we would set up a podcast with somebody in the room with me because I was like, yeah. oh, do I put the microphone like in the middle oh, of yeah. the two of us? Do we both have microphones? Yeah, What's I, the deal here? <laughs> I, I, mean, it's easier I think, if you're I think isolated. We, we get a both. We both get a microphone. Just put a cardboard box like shield in between us, and we just can't look yeah. at each other the whole time. Uh, we, yeah, we, we don't even that. have the um, we don't even have the video chat on when we do these. It's just as it's intended. Uh, you're listening to us disembodied from a face, and I talk to Chris disembodied 
mm-hmm. with our faces. This so was all good. Literally, the idea was, uh, and I think you, you would agree, Mike. We's like, we're just going to record our phone call with each other and see how that goes. And that's what this podcast has become. Essentially, if yes, you heard us but, talking on the phone uh, in the middle of the day about this stuff, uh, this just uh, this is the total tangent. We're already off the rails, but it just reminded me of like two pet peeves that I hate with podcasts. The first one is a podcast that will almost entirely have their guest or their co-host on just a really crappy Skype recording. Mm -hmm. Like that drives me crazy. Like we have technology now is much better than it was just even five years ago with audio recording. Now just anybody walks into like any electronic store by any device, like any electronic device, probably like your air fryer has a better uh, microphone and audio recording than like a 10 year old computer. And then just have them locally record their audio on their side. It drives me crazy. I, I get it sometimes. Like if you're listening to like a, like a nonfiction, like journalistic type of thing and like the reporter is like literally dialing in and it's for Mm. a segment or something that's totally okay it actually adds a little bit of like color you know to the audio of like oh this person's like reporting in live from the field or whatever but that drives me crazy so i'm glad that we don't do that we never i think we've had to resorted to it like maybe once or twice when something technically has gone wrong we we have we have several situations in place for backups now thankfully so we don't have that issue but but early on i think maybe once or twice we had to resort to real roughness uh, yeah but number two and this one is a somewhat new pet peeve i don't come across often but if you're a podcast that's lucky enough that have been out there for a while sometimes they want to flash back you know, to memories in the in their uh, podcast archives and react to them, talk about them. But it's an audio medium. So if you just take that audio and start playing it and then start talking over it, I have no idea what's from the past. I have no idea what's from now. And it just sounds like everyone's talking over each other. So if there happens to be podcast producers listening to this podcast, uh, just do do some sort of filter like you know when like you're watching a tv show and they do like a flashback or a dream sequence and they just slap a sepia tone on there or something like that like just put like a distortion on top of like your flashback audio like it could sound like a little old timey oh, or maybe make it sound a little flat or muted or do do something to it so i know what i'm listening to i, I is think a you, flashback. i think you have to do it kind of like where like kind of what they do on like um a movie interviews and stuff like where they, they they show old clips and they react to it, but like you like okay, we're gonna play the old clip, boom, and they can talk over it, but they they separate the audio where the reaction is played right after the clip instead, um, right? That way, like you should react to it rather than talk at the like you said at the same time, right? Because that that, that maybe works on video mediums, but not audio. And I just I don't even think I think adding an extra layer of static to that, like you mentioned, would just make you drive you even more crazy hearing three different things come at you come at you at the same time so um i I, promise to never do that to you loyal listeners yes i yeah yeah. we 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 try we try our hardest we try to put out at least the best quality of of things we can here uh despite you know just literally just sitting down and winging it on a sunday what it feels like sometimes um but um yeah let's, let's let's get into what you've been doing you've you've been um Working out, and while you've been working out, you you catch up on movies uh, that you 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 re- we essentially have revisited a lot of movies here. You've got one new one um, that just came out this week, but you you revisited a bunch of movies here. So uh, and and so did I. So let's jump into what you did. You've been talking yes, about I've these. Opened, I've opened the door back into Phase Four of Marvel. Uh, wrapped up Shang Chi and rewatched Multiverse of Badness. And uh, these both of these movies were either just as good or better than I remember them being. So uh, it, 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 I had only ever watched these in theaters. I never rewatched them. So uh, the only lingering memory I had of Shang-Chi, surprisingly, was just I liked Simu Liu um, as um, Shang-Chi. And that was like the only memory I had from the movie. I was like, well, uh, do I have any other opinions on this film? So I'm glad I went back and rewatched it. And I was surprised that uh, the fight choreography is great. I love it. The stunts, the uh, the fight scene on the bus at the beginning, the, um, the kind of um, scaffolding outside of his sister's fight club on that building. That was really, really cool. But I do remember I had this opinion when I watched it the first time and we did the spoiler cast of the third act is surprisingly the least interesting part of the movie and that's pretty surprising if you were to tell somebody it has like two dueling dragons in a mystical world um 
it's just not it just wasn't as excited i felt like i didn't have any sort of um i don't know just care for these people in this alternate world like i'm just not grounded in their village i don't really get to see them live their life you know it clashes with the i guess the grounded realness of the fight scenes in the first half as you mentioned right like it feels very much like these these are real fights are happening. They're visceral. They're, they're choreographed in a real life way, right? Uh, and then you get into a mystical world that kind of flips a little bit. It's, it's essentially, the world would literally flip upside down, if you will, to be more yeah. mystical and not have that groundedness that was yeah, in it, that, it's, the beginning. It just seems so. It just seems so unreal and unrealistic, which I know seems silly within um, this kind of like fantasy realm. Uh, that it, it was like, oh, am I watching like a dream, you know? Um, but overall, uh, I do remember one other thing uh, that I liked the first time I watched it, and it was just the physicality of like of the Ten Rings themselves, like the weapon. It's mm. just very interesting. It's what makes Spider-Man really, really cool. Like he's a superhero with this unique power set, and he gets to do visually compelling things on screen. And I feel like the rings lend to that as well. So uh, I'm happy that a lot of that still held up. So uh, all that being said, uh, looking forward to the next time we get to see Shang on screen. I think it's going to be great. And then the multiverse of badness, uh, it was weird. We watched the movie in theaters. We hopped on mic and we reviewed it. And I remember loving it. And then after the movie came out, I started hearing a lot of these like sour reactions to the film of like things that they didn't like about it. And then I feel like it started to poison me a little bit. And I was like, oh, was the movie as good as I thought it was? You know, am I just going in with some sort of um, rose tinted spectacle? And then I went back and rewatched it and I was like, no, this movie's great. I mean, Sam Raimi gives um, a visually... Um, striking difference to this movie that a lot of other Marvel films don't have. They just don't have that style. Uh, I love seeing zombie Doctor Strange again. That guy is like so cool. Um, All of the characters I feel like are properly motivated and the threats seem real to me. And the the story is so much more tragic than I remember it being for um, for for the Scarlet Witch. Like she really goes through it in this movie, and it was helpful for me to remember. Like, oh, she's going so crazy because she starts to delve so deep into the dark hold, and that's kind of like the biggest contrast, right? She you leave on a hopeful note after the end of WandaVision, and then we see her again in Doctor Strange, and she's like gone crazy. So I don't know if an additional scene or something could have helped or maybe well, this would have bogged so the movie down. But you never really get to see her the, delve into madness. You the know? asterisk there is that they were supposed to release in tandem. And they I think they said so they reshot the ending or redid the ending um, of WandaVision because they didn't know when Doctor Strange was going to come out during because of the you know the delays they had on it mm-hmm. with the pandemic. So I think there was something there. But, you know, with that time frame in between of it going from like – Hey, it was supposed to be like a month to, what was it, like a year, year and a half maybe? Um, it, it probably needed that a little bit, that little lift to get there. Yeah. But. I mean, the only thing I think I don't like about this movie is uh, this is just uh, a display of some of the most obvious wigs I've ever seen in, in a movie before. Uh, I don't. I guess I just didn't notice them as much the first time around, but Doctor Strange is wigging it up. Uh, Rachel McAdams is wigging it up. Uh, the Scarlet Witch is wigging it up. Everybody's got wigs at some point in time in this movie, mm-hmm. and they are painfully obvious, um, which I, it was kind of funny more often than not, uh, but it was distracting, to say the least. And then I don't know anatomically what a third eyeball is supposed to look like on somebody's forehead, but we do get to see that a couple of times in this movie, and I'm like, I don't know if I would do anything differently. But this mm-hmm. just doesn't seem right to me. I don't know what it is. I don't know if you need to add a third eyebrow up there or if something needs to be added or taken away. But the third eyeball is distracting to me, and it just looks – it just doesn't look it's flat. Well, It looks flat. <laughs> it, like, it should be, like, recessed, right? Like, it looks like they, you know, they essentially cloned his eyes together and, and put it up there in, like, um, compositing. But it looks – to me, it looks flat on, on every strange, right? Like – it should be, you know, an eyeball has like a depth to it and like the nose bridge makes it like the shadow, but there isn't anything on your forehead to give it a shadow. And it just looks like, oh, it should be there. I always think, you know, I, I don't think there's any way to make a third eye look good because I always think back to Dragon Ball with TN, 
having his third eye. I'm like, boy, that doesn't look good either on him. And he's a cartoon character. So <laughs> I, I don't think there's any way to make that look uh, <laughs> good at the end of the day either. But to sneak in one final thing before we uh, move on to what you did, Chris, this week, uh, we checked out Hitman on Netflix this weekend. My wife and I, I had to tell her, I was like, uh, you don't know who Glenn Powell is uh, because we haven't watched the sequel to Top Gun. Um, but he's like, he's all of a sudden uh, Hollywood's it guy. So we're going to have to watch Hitman because he's probably going to be in like a Marvel movie or a DC movie at some point in time. I mean, technically he was like an extra like a featured extra in um, uh, the Dark Knight Rises. I just saw that on TikTok over the weekend. But all of a sudden, he's like super famous now. So mm-hmm. I was like, well, we got to familiarize ourselves with this guy. And he's in a movie on Hitman. And, um, uh, what's the, he was in that one movie with? Um, oh shit, uh, Sydney Sweeney. Sydney anyone, Sweeney. Anyone but yeah, anyone because, but you. Anyone but you as well. Yeah, and he, may, he's in Twisters and that, in a, in, a, in a month. So yeah, that's coming out. Yeah, so he's he's about to be the guy. Right, so you got to catch him where he's at before he takes off. But Hitman was really, really good. Um, it it's a movie that you think you know where it's gonna go. Um, you you feel like they set up the premise. You can kind of see the writing on the wall, but then they do a really good job of doing the unexpected. Uh, I wouldn't say there's necessarily twists in this movie. I'm not trying to set you up going like, oh wow, there's gonna be all of these like layers in there but they they just go in a different direction and it was just refreshing Mm -hmm. um it's a it's billed as a comedy there's a little bit of uh uh, romance in there not a whole lot there's not enough here to call it a romantic comedy i don't think at least uh but it was it was great we really really liked it um i think it'll be i think it'll be a hit i think people really like it this one and then um uh, mike and i beforehand he you know he was uh he said it was written and uh, well, co-written by Glenn Powell, but also uh, written, co-written, and directed by Richard Linklater, who has done movies such as um, School of Rock and what was the other one I said? Days and Confused. And then I told him about the Before Trilogy. If anyone hasn't caught that, I would recommend looking up the Before Trilogy as well. It started in 95 with Before, I think, Sunrise. And it's got Ethan Hawke and I forget the actress's name. But... um they did one in the '90s, one in the 2000s, one in the I think 2013, and they are the same characters, the same actors, like evolving actually, like in real time, kind of thing. Um, so, but it's it's great, you know, because I know, and and this isn't spoiler. I saw this in, on the poster. My hitman is Glenn Powell plays multiple characters. Correct. That's that's what I get from the mm-hmm. poster. So, um, is this like a more of a sci-fi movie? You would say an action movie no or? no not it's uh, this is actually very realistic okay. i don't know a hundred percent um how much this sticks to it but apparently it's loosely based on a true story and the the movie kind of postulates to the audience that hitmen are totally a hollywood invention mm-hmm. and the idea that you could just go out there in the real world and hire somebody to um kill somebody for you is actually totally fictitious but since they have been so prominent in our culture just we just assume that they're real so it's just kind of that i i don't want to yeah, yeah, no, like, fine. give yeah. too much too much it, away but i thought that was kind of interesting because like well that's true i mean i don't think i've like 99 percent of the things i've ever heard about hitmen have been from the entertainment industry i don't even know if i've ever read like a news article about a hit man per se. I well, you know, you've definitely I, seen assassinations, but it's always been like governmental or there, terroristic well, there's those, or there's always those know. news articles. Like, uh, you know, a husband killed someone like a quote unquote, a hit man to off his wife or like vice versa. But it's never like, it's never like the hit man of the movies, right? It's like some guy three towns over who, you know, will do anything for money kind of thing. So, um, but I, I didn't know if it was sci-fi. It looks sci-fi from the poster, and I couldn't tell, so I figured I'd just gauge that from yeah, you. Yeah, go, go check it out. It's good. I'd recommend it. Okay. That's great. Cause, well, the other uh, Netflix option is Atlas, uh, the the Ooh. Simulu movie. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I was like, I was like, well, maybe he'd watch that one since he got, got off Shang-Chi. Uh, you top of the charge, but, could, but it wasn't good. He could, be, he could be making strategical moves, because you brought up Sidney Sweeney just earlier with uh, that movie Anyone But You. Um, I think if I remember right, the reason that movie got made along with her Barbarella movie 
that's yeah. coming out soonish. The reasons that those even got made was she agreed to be in Madam, Madam Web, Web yep. for Sony, and that's the story out there in Hollywood yep. right now. That that's the bargain that she made that she would be in this obviously bad movie yeah. uh, in order to get these other projects greenlit. And I just think that's like super smart. And, <laughs> and I would say one of the things that you, you meaning people don't know about Sydney Sweeney, she's a producer. She has a production company that she actually owns. So those are her movies that she made like through her production company through the distribution agreement through Sony. So, um, yes, she's being very smart about this stuff. And she's like, and literally, I think in the interview, she's like, I don't care how bad it is. I got what I wanted out of it right at the end of the mm-hmm. day. And and that is that is awesome uh, for that. Well, I'm going to flip the script here. Um, Mike, Mike went back, you know, five years. I went back 30 years, Mike. And I have been revisiting, as I mentioned last week, stuff on our tube TV and – um, I put it on random, and the first movie that popped up on random this week was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the original movie, Mike. And we, we always talk about the turtles here. You, you've got a love for the turtles. Um, and um, this movie holds a lot of, uh, I guess, I wouldn't say love in people's hearts. I mean, people might love it, but it's got a lot of memories because of those actual like physical body suits they wore in these movies, right? And um, re- revisiting this, it has got some of the worst dialogue. <laughs> it's a very late 80s dialogue. But it is so, I guess, of the comic books. Like I'm like, I could see every one of these scenes being drawn in a Turtles comic book throughout it. Um, I, I do think I, it, it's fun. It was a great time to visit. We didn't have the ninja rap in this one, but we got you know Shredder. And um, you know Splinter, obviously, is a big rat. And uh, they're... Uh, they have like the, the no, it's not a seance, but they commune with them through the ninja spirits. But one of the things I, I think that is just, you know, very distracting about this movie sometimes is when you realize that you can see the people under the suit, like in their mouths, like they were just kind of painted. And like, oh, I didn't notice this as a child. Is that like, like you mentioned wigs earlier. I'm like, is that something you watch just because you're like enthralled with the story and seeing turtles come to life? Or is it because, mm-hmm. you know, now I'm like, oh, it's not on a better screen. I'm like, oh, I'm just noticing these things now. Is that like, I don't know. So, did you ever remember noticing the people in the turtle mouths? Like, whenever uh, they were no. In? I mean, I was a child. Yeah. I, everything that I saw in the movies was a uh, uh, wonderful. It was a documentary? I never any of it? It was gay. <laughs> For all I know, it was real. One thing I just learned recently is the, um, at least the original uh, one that you're talking about here. I don't know about the sequels. But the original one for the longest time was one of the most successful independent films. I didn't I didn't realize I don't know exactly what qualifies it as an independent film necessarily, but that's what it was. I guess somebody went out there, raised money on their own film and shot this and then went out to Hollywood and said, hey, who wants to distribute this movie? I thought that was pretty wild because usually IP based movies, that's not how it goes now. Yeah. I, I do think, you know, the fact that they were able to bring the turtles into these suits and like I didn't for once think I'm like, oh man, this this isn't I don't know, it's not like the Michael Bay ones where it's like CGI. There's something about just having the tactile suits there that was really cool. Uh and thankfully, I mean, they learned their lesson from uh Howard the Duck, right? Whenever that was just a big robot suit and these actually had the people in them with obviously some animatronics. But I had a good time revisiting that. It was just it, it doesn't it's not as much fun to to watch, but I mean, it still it still holds up. Uh, you know, just to have that that nostalgia there. In a movie I never grew up with, Mike, and a lot of people have. Uh, my wife was quoting this as it was going on, and I I don't know much about it. Is actually the Princess Bride, and I don't know how much exposure you had to this as a child either. Just kind of gauging. I I had absolutely no exposure okay, to yeah. this as a child, and I watched it for the first time maybe like a year and a half ago. Yeah. Like, I've seen clips, and I, I think I, I might have watched it at one point, but, like, you know, I'm more familiar with, like, the scenes from the movie rather than the actual, like, whole part of the movie. But um, one of the things that made me think, you know, this movie you know, made me think about is um, Carrie Elwes, the, the main actor, right, in The Princess Bride, he is literally a man who can play a straight-faced man or, like, a a comedian in any role he wants to do, Mike. And I started going through the roles because I was like, oh, I'm going to quote Robin Hood Men in Tights because I know him from that role, right? Where he's essentially playing another, like, you know, early 90s swashbuckler, if you will, the Robin Hood mm-hmm. of that. And then I'm like, well, he was also, like, one of the dudes in the first Saw movie, like, the guy who had to, like, cut his foot off or whatever. I'm like, oh, he can do oh, yeah. horror <laughs> films. Uh, he's also, um, you know, kind of thinking for He was the, was the king uh, in 
the uh, Rebel Moon movies. I'm like, okay, that's good. Good for oh. you, still get work. <laughs> yeah, um, but the, at the same, then on the flip side, in the news, Mission Impossible, he's like, I think the president or like you know the head of the FBI or somebody like that. Like, uh, and I'm like, he can literally go all across the spectrum in any of his roles he wants to be in. And I'm like, that guy, that guy is a great actor. I mean, we, when uh, when will we get him in a superhero movie? That That's the question. What when, when, what are we going to get him in? Uh, unless he's already been in one, and then I feel stupid, but I don't think he's been in any offhand. Uh, and then, the obviously, on the opposite side, the actual princess in that movie uh, is Robin Wright, who went on to play um, in T.P. Wonder Woman's aunt in the Wonder Woman films uh, with hmm. you know, Godot. So, um, very... Very good. Uh, good. I actually named my cat after her character. So, uh, and then the other movie I watched, Mike, is Good Burger, the original Good Burger, uh, the Nickelodeon <laughs> oh, film. And um, boy, do do movies of the the late nineties, early two thousands have a flavor, if you will. <laughs> and this movie, it made me think of you. If I'm going to be completely honest, because the whole crux of this movie is um, there is a restaurant called the Good Burger that's barely hanging on but they have a really dedicated worker played by um uh kel mitchell and he's just an absolute doofus and he, he lives to be at the good burger thing and then there's a um it's i forget it's, it's not called like the omega burger but it's like another burger joint opening across the street and they're like is it is it mondo burger mondo burger yeah yeah and it's yeah. like we've got bigger burgers and stuff like that and then they're all like oh we're never gonna get business we're gonna go get closed and then kel's character he makes a special sauce mike literally the Ooh. special sauce he makes, and that's what makes people want to come back to Good Burger and, and saves the day at the end of the day because he's able to have his special sauce on these burgers that make them taste better. So are you saying this remind this reminds me – are you reminded of me because of there's a special sauce? There's a special like – you love sauces. special sauces, yeah. <laughs> but, that, but like at the same time, I'm like if there was ever like, oh, we need like um, some sort of special sauce to make this movie popular – uh, oh, it literally, it, it is literally a special sauce. It's not even like figuratively. It's literally, I'm like, this is like so on the nose of special sauce. It's, it's, um, it's well, wild. Now you got, now you got to go watch the sequel. You got to watch the I, sequel. And let me know if it's worth, I'm, I'm not excited. Exa- I have no interest in watching the sequel. I had no interest in watching the first one. The shuffle was against me, uh, for, for Gunberger. Um, it was this <laughs> or for a few, for, was it for a few Fistful Dollars More or whatever it's called. A Clint Eastwood movie. I'm like, I'm good. Mm-hmm. I'm not watching a Clint Eastwood movie today. Uh, we don't need a Western in the house uh, for this. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what the shuffle will take me through on the next ones. I think um, the, the last week, did I tell you we watched The Mummy? I don't know if I, we, we had watched The Mummy. Yeah, the last yeah, one. yeah, I think you mentioned that. So um, my wife was going down that road. And so it was, uh, it was fun to see, you know, her, I guess, exposure to these older movies that um, – the, the, uh, well, she's watching. I haven't watched. But we're here for news. Let's jump into the news, Mike. Uh, we've been talking about Captain America Brave New World. Um, the newest report uh, is from uh, someone. We don't actually have a photo, but someone on set. that Benedict Wong, who plays Wong, uh, was on set in Atlanta filming. And um, the reason I was like, oh, why would he be in Captain America Brave New World? Uh, he has that connection to the Abomination. Uh, right, and uh, like this movie is essentially a spiritual sequel to the Hulk, the Incredible Hulk movie. Um, so uh, he could be doing something with the Abomination in in this, these scenes. Yeah, I just watched. Uh, I just watched Wong in two movies. Yeah. Uh, uh, Shang Chi is Wong in every Phase Four movie, no. or did I just happen he, to pick the two that he's in? You have to pick he's, the two he's in, but um, he's been in some. Was he in a TV show? I think he wasn't. In, oh, he, he was. Go he ahead. was in She-Hulk. Yeah. Um, was not the Marvels. Felt, was uh, he in one other? I feel like he was in another Disney Plus show, but maybe I'm um, imagining that. Yeah. Uh, no, he's in something. He's in something else because, or maybe that's like the end credit scene of the end of She-Hulk where he like uh, hangs out on a couch with What's-Her-Face. Yeah. Um, uh, doc, uh, he's <laughs> in No Way Home. No Way Home is the other one we're thinking of. Um, oh, Okay. So that's that's kind of I just pulled up the, his his wiki page here, um, yeah. Doctor, it, it went from Spider Man No Way Home to Doctor Strange to She Hulk. So yeah, nothing else. He's the he's yeah. the he's the Nick Fury of uh, Phase Four, I yeah. guess. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, he's pretty mystical. It seems like most of the stuff that he is connected to 
Um, seems to be pretty super powered. But yeah, you're right. I just watched him in Shang Chi with, with, the with the abomination. Yeah, yeah. So um, it could could be could be that. Um, obviously, he post in game. We've not really had a big like, hey, everybody knows each other because we all fought in the big battle kind of thing yet. So um, could just be you know he maybe he knows Sam Wilson better uh, at that point. I I don't know, but um, he's been on set and um, obviously. I think he's going to be uh, Benedict Wong, a, a character to kind of start pulling this stuff together as we get towards all the other things. Um, and but- there is always a disclaimer that uh, Marvel seems to shoot almost everything in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. So if anyone's down there for any reason, you know, yeah. they might just uh, show up on set just to say, hey, yeah. but... Uh, Probably not. It, uh, I'm sure he's a busy man that doesn't need to be there if he doesn't need to well, be there. Well, they also filmed the other Marvel stuff in uh, the UK, which is where he's from. So, uh, b- big trip for that. I, I assume we're going to see a photo probably after we get done recording of him in this actual outfit uh, and and go down that road. But they, they did not have one at that time. Now, the people on set, though, were able to get some of those, um, some videos of Mr. Giancarlo Esposito filming um on set looks like he's uh has has a shootout on a on a highway scene here and it's it's a two and a half minute clip you don't have to watch it but like you know he's obviously they're filming uh it's it's a scene out and you know, he kicks a door closed i watched it earlier this week um you know the other thing i was looking at is he you know in the comic books there was a character called jake fury which is nick fury's brother now the more i thought about it, the more i looked at him, i'm like this guy could literally be nick fury's brother in this like same age range same like kind of what he was wearing last week, what we saw seems to be on par with the Fury brother kind of vibe. Yeah. It makes me wonder, uh, since we got a peek into Fury's personal life and secret invasion, even though it seems like that show was going to be swept under the rug, possibly. Um, I mean, we got to see the inside of his house was, I wonder if there were any family pictures that might've hinted, that he had uh, he had more oh, I, than just uh, an alien wife. I, I, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think I don't think that that movie or that TV series thought anything more than "Hey, can we get to the end credits uh, today?" So um, I don't think there's any setups in, in that. But you know, knowing you know they have been pulling. There's some a comic book series called Secret Warriors, which is one of my all time favorite comic book series. Uh, it's a very like a thirty issue thing. But Jake uh, Jake Fury was. Um, a, like an undercover villain for a while uh, in that. So like, you know, I, I know him a little bit from that, but I don't know what we, he could literally be anybody and we're probably going to be underwhelmed when it comes out to be someone who doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Right. Big name for, for stuff that, but if it is Jake Fury and there, he's going to be in TV series, as he said afterwards, that would make sense to have a, another Fury, like I guess on earth doing the, um the dirty work that Nick Fury's not doing. Cause he's out in space at the end of the day. Yeah, it is kind of nice though, just to see the the news start to spin up again, right? I feel like it's been a while since we've had these types of conversations on the podcast mm-hmm. of oh, there's set photos to talk about. There's a mysterious uh, new actor out there filming scenes. You know, for so many years, a lot of this stuff was paused. Yeah, uh, it's kind of nice to have it back. Yeah, it's paused when the pandemic, then the actor strike, then the writer strike. Oh, it was a it was a writer strike, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, everything everything is, is seems to be make up, and this is again a um, result of uh, the the redo of this this entire movie. And the other thing is during this uh, onset, um, Sam Wilson, or I guess Anthony Mackie, is wearing his suit from the Falcon and the Winter Soldier show. And so we know we, we've seen the blue one that he's going to probably get by the end of the movie, but it looks like it will be a journey to that blue one, Mike, rather than just he starts off in the new one from the get go. Um, yeah, that's usually how these uh, usually how these uh, movies work. <laughs> yeah. There, yeah, there's always a suit up scene, right? Yeah. Well, it, the other thing is, I, you know, again, we've since we've known this movie has been done, quote unquote, done for a long time, they're reshooting everything. I wonder um, if they're trying to maybe not retcon or maybe connect it more to to some of that other stuff to say, hey, look, we we have to acknowledge it um, along the way, um, bring it back to to the world. So. Um, it's, it's interesting to say it's a black and white photo, but that white is very, very um, con- contrasty against the rest. So it, look, it looks good. Moving into World War Hulk, we talked about this a little bit at the top of the show, um, is is that uh, the movie, a movie for World War Hulk, not a series, is being set up for a future project. And we've said this before, you know, um, 
so we're kind of kind of blue in the face here. But the idea is that Bruce Banner uh, has been afraid of the government's getting his blood, as we saw kind of in She-Hulk, and creating their own super soldiers. So we're going to see after Captain America: Brave New World, the um, the leader, the red potential Red Hulk we've seen from the toys, the government's fighting over the celestial body that has been rumored in that movie. The also vibranium that was at France trying to get vibranium in Wakanda, um, the the second Black Panther movie. So it looks like this is going to be a part where like the other countries are starting to dive into this a little bit. Uh, and um, it could be the rumor is that it's a breaking point for Bruce Banner and returns of the instead of a Professor Hulk, we're going to get that Savage Hulk, which is like he has to come out to be like to beat the other ones, I guess, at the end of the day. Um, yeah, I feel like there's some interesting pathos you could tell with a movie like this, right? Because the whole arc of the MCU, or at least the way it started, was when we put on Iron Man 1, we're ostensibly watching just our very own world. You know, our real grounded world start to change as these superheroes start to come out of the woodwork and we start to learn more and more and more. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're just a normal, like bad guy in the world, right, you're watching the TV and the news just like everybody else. And now all of a sudden the Hulk went from like a random green gra- guy that you saw in like one brief news bro- clip to bro- all of a Carlum, sudden, yeah. yeah, to all of a sudden being like a celebrity that you can just go up to in a diner, you know, and take yeah. pictures with. So I, there's some interesting things that you could do there where his popularity, you know, him just trying to be normal is actually very dangerous because he's now a target all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I wonder if they could play around with that at all he, because he has come a long way. Like he's made a whole arc of just being a guy that's struggling with this demon inside of him to now they've reached this point of harmony. I mean, he was doing like yoga on a cliff face and she hulk right he's like Mm. kind of become so now if if, to do another movie you're gonna have to tear him back down yeah in a a creative way and and if again with we've seen the advents of like we have the leader we have she hulk we have his son scar we have potentially the red hulk uh, the abominations out there like they have set up a lot of hulk players in the world right but i think we've always said you know all the stuff literally almost everything we've ever seen minus secret invasion which will probably be swept under the rug again is set in America. So how are other countries dealing with literally every superhero in the world being in the U S and like, how do they try to, I guess, try to catch up. Right. Would be my thing. And obviously the Hulk's blood created captain America, you know, that that's how they, they did it. Um, or captain America's blood created the Hulk the other way from the incredible Hulk. So like, you know, how do we, how do other countries play catch up, make their own super soldiers. And, um, I could see a world war Hulk being those other countries doing that. And, um, not doing it the right way, I guess, uh, to to cause some some problems. I, I'd love to see that. I would love to see this movie. It doesn't need to be the comic book version, right? They can take the title. We're never. We've already gotten the World Breaker Hulk look from Thor Ragnarok. He's not going to come back to Earth and try to take it over and take avenge on the Illuminati. So if it's World War Hulk is like all the countries are making Hulks slash super soldiers, and he's got to step up and do something. Sign me up. Let's let's see that version of it mm-hmm. along the way. Um, moving on, um, I think we, we talked about Hulk being a big part of Avengers 5, but we've got some news on Avengers 5 that uh, director Sean Levy uh, from upcoming Deadpool and Wolverine uh, is it in talks to direct film again. I, we didn't even know he was in talks the first time, Mike, is, is what happened. Uh, he apparently was offered the movie, but passed uh, a while ago, but because of the delays in um, the Avengers 5 movies and everything kind of being reworked, uh, it's given... Uh, Levy an opening again to work on this movie if you want. So he is in talks to possibly take over as a director for this. Yeah. I I mean, I don't want to make this sound like an insult because Sean Levy is a very successful creative, but he does kind of seem like the, the safe choice director, right? You know, it seems like if you got like a summer kind of blockbuster action movie, uh, especially maybe if there's some humor thrown there, like put Sean Levy on the case and he will execute. It makes me think of like when uh, for um, the solo movie, they had to bring in uh, Ron Howard. Mm-hmm. I feel like I had very similar opinions there of like, oh, they just want somebody here that they know they can get the job done. You know, best case scenario, 
you know, you're going to get like an eight out of 10 movie, worst case scenario, maybe like a seven and a half out of 10. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, 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 I would like more bigger swings in the MCU and maybe we're going to be talking about a slightly bigger swing in director well, here uh, in a couple segments. But, like, I can't be mad about this, but I'm also, I'm not, like, I don't, super excited about it. You know? I, I disagree. I think the writing has to knock it out of the park. I don't think the director matters in this situation. But I would say the only director, I think, who could pull off Deadpool and Wolverine, and, like, that movie does should not exist in the MC, right? It is, it is R-rated. It is raunchy is an angry wolverine and brought back hugh jackman it shouldn't work it shouldn't exist um and, and he was able to do that i think i think if you have a good writing team they will make the movie good and the director will bring out again the audiences because i was thinking about this earlier and I, this week and i don't think it was this but the idea that a movie lives and dies on its directing name rather than the entire crew who puts it together is is kind of a that's a wrong way to think about it because it takes an editor. It takes a, you know, a director, it takes a cinematographer, it takes everyone to make a movie. So I think by saying, yeah, he's going to be the linchpin of this. I don't think so on something of this scale and this, this, uh, I guess scope, I, you know, I, I was looking at Sean Levy. I, I couldn't tell you right now. I don't know if you've looked this up, Mike, other than the recent Ryan Reynolds stuff he's done. Could you tell me something else he's directed? Sean <laughs> I'm literally only thinking of Ryan Reynolds stuff because he did, he did Free Guy. Yep. Um, what was that? Adam Time Project. Travel one, the Adam Project. Yep. There's like one other that's like kind of bubbling right on the front of my head that I feel like Ryan Reynolds wasn't involved in, but I can't. So oh, I can't think of it. So there, there's no, I don't see any other Ryan Reynolds movies on his thing right now. Um, he did all three Night at the Museum movies. That's what they were, because we just recently watched all of them in this house. Yeah. <laughs> we rewatched all the Night at the Museum he, movies. He did, you know, the um, Cheaper by the Dozen reboot with uh, uh, Steve Martin. Real Steel is his connection to Hugh Jackman. And then he took, like, after Night at the Museum, uh, Secret of the Tomb, he took off seven years before Free Guy. So, and then he's got, I think he signed up for a Star Wars film, too. So I don't think he'll, if, if Star Wars, if he doesn't take Star Wars... He'll do this. If not, he'll do Star Wars. But, you know, they, they, they tend to not really make any Star Wars movies at Star Wars right now. So. You know what? I'm, I'm so glad you brought this up. This is absolutely wild. I can't believe I, for, I forgot about this. But the Night at the Museum movies were never really on my radar. I think I watched the first one when it came out, and that was about it. And then my wife has more nostalgia for them, so we kind of went back and we watched them. I think it's the third Night at the Museum movie the characters are like running through London or something and they bust into um, uh, a theater and there's a play happening on stage and uh, Hugh Jackman is on stage oh. and and he's literally is Hugh Jackman because he's trying to like de-escalate the situation with Ben Stiller and he's just like, oh, I'm Hugh, you, you might know me, I'm Hugh Jackman. Oh, no, it's not Ben Stiller. It's like some sort of Egyptian yeah. that's come back to life because the Egyptian has no idea who this is. But it's actually pretty funny because he's like, he does the whole like Wolverine, like claws out, clench, oh, yeah. bent over to try to convince this guy who he is. He's like, no, nah, sorry, I don't know yeah. who you are. But well, I was like, oh, this is pretty wild. It's well, worth it just for that one moment in the movie. Absolutely. <laughs> and, I, and, I, I, and I'm going to, to apologize. I forgot to look down at the television section of his work. He has directed eight episodes of Stranger Things. Um, oh, wow. Including like See, the award-winning the, one, Dear Billy, which is the one with the uh, – where what's-her-name is floating. I'm, te so. I'm, telling you, I'm telling you, Chris, if you just put all of his body of work in a blender – and blend it up. You are sitting at a, like a safe eight, yeah, and but, that's not bad. And not, it's not an insult either. That's just weird. That's I, I'm just stating. I'm just stating an opinion, and I feel like I I don't have a spin on it. Like that's all I got. Like we are probably gonna have a good movie if he's directing it. Right. Right. Well, and I think, and I I do, and I think my my point with this is saying if he can do Stranger Things and um, Free Guy or uh, Adam Project, he he's not. I think he's not. Um, genre siloed, if you will, right? He can do horror and drama. He can do comedy and, and levity as well. So uh, I think as long as the script is good, I think he'd do it. The last thing I'm going to say about Sean Levy is um, I, I'm going I'm to give him a, a, a love and a hate right here for you, Mike. 
Um, the Love, he directed five ep- episodes of Animorphs in the late 90s. <laughs> um, and I love I love Animorphs. Uh, the Hate is, uh, I don't know if you ever watched that short-lived Birds of Prey TV show from 2002. Um, oh. <laughs> based on the DC comic book characters. Uh, yeah, he, he did he did uh, uh, an episode of that. But, I mean, works, that works. Just, that, so. to me, just seems like a guy that's out there just trying to get his career started. But, just but, trying to get some work. <laughs> but but it seems like the, the script is what ruined that show, not necessarily the director. So, uh, I, I'm excited for this. I think it's great. Um, also, you know, we're going to reiterate this movie will be grounded story with multiversal aspects. No big deal. Now, this is the other rumor that came out for this week. Sources are saying that this project could have more than 60 MCU characters. And I say, I think people are thinking Avengers 5 is one movie when they're saying the next Avengers movies will have over 60 characters. I don't think the next one will have 60 characters. Do you? The King, yeah, I mean, we were King talk- Dynasty one. I mean, we were. I mean, we were thinking that uh, that would probably be reserved for Secret Wars. You know, yeah. Um, I'm really curious w- what we're looking at here with Avengers five and Avengers six, and I'm curious if it's going to be structured a little bit more like Infinity War and Endgame. You know, a part one and a part two, but not necessarily, you know, nothing happening in between the two of them, just like the last ones. I mean, it may it worked, right? It worked with the last two set of movies. So, you know, do you try that again? Um, if there's multiversal aspects, I'm just trying to think, like, what does that mean? Just because aspects seems like such a, a word, like, oh, we've lightly seasoned this movie well, yeah. with multiversal stuff. And, like, the multiverse is such a compounding, gigantic thing happening. So it makes me wonder if maybe some sort of rift has opened and the antagonist has slipped over from another universe, right? And yeah. Then it's, as they're fighting that person, they start to learn of the more of the problems that are bubbling up and that it, will lead you into your secret wars. I, I know we're back to where they might have Kang again and they recast him. So I think the aspects will be like, we have a Kang that they're fighting and then we're going to learn about the other ones for secret wars. Like, you know, like we're going, like you mentioned, we're going to seed the seeds. We're going to set it up. Uh, Secret Wars, I mean, let's, we'll just get into it. The next part of this is Secret Wars. And Secret Wars will be a, probably be a multi part film. And that's fine with me. If they need two movies to tell the story because there's so many characters, Mike, I'm fine with that, right? Like that, that is cool to, to tell a good story. But I think it's going to be very multiversal in Secret Wars. Like maybe the end of five, act three, like, okay, we've beaten the big bad, but oh, wait. We've doomed the earth, the, you know, it's going to crash, whatever. We'll talk about some of these things Secret Wars will borrow from. But, like, I think that's what they're talking about. Like, Secret Wars 1, 2, whatever it's going to be, is going to be the big multiversal culmination and finale all within two movies, if you will. Yeah, uh, like, are we talking about, you know, incursions here? Yeah. You know, what exactly is going to be happening? You know, it, are we just going to... You know, is Kang going to be defeated in Avengers Five and Secret Wars is going to be you know more battle world oriented? So, you know, you, I mean, you just watched Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. It ended with the threat of incursions, not with the threat of Kang, right? So, like, there mm-hmm. is the idea like the worlds are collapsing because they're colliding, um, or you know, the rumor uh, you know we, we've heard from the rumors for Deadpool, like you know, the, there's like totems in the universe, like we talked about Spider Man being a totem, and if like some character in that universe dies, the universe fades away. Um, they've all taken this from comic books. So the idea of Secret Wars is going to borrow from three books. Number one, uh, the more recently Avengers Assemble uh, story by Jason Aaron, where reality was rewritten to get rid of the main universe, uh, 616 Avengers in the comics, but they are pursued through multiverse and meet variations on themselves, including like the 1 billion BC universe, Avenger, 1 billion BC Avengers and stuff like that. Uh, they could also borrow from Avengers Forever, which is character Rick Jones, Normally, a Hulk character assembles different Avengers um, from different times to fend off an attack from Immortus, who is a Kang variant. And lastly, as you mentioned, Time Runs Out, which is Jonathan Hickman's Avengers versus the Illuminati. The Illuminati are destroying worlds so they don't incur have incursions with their world, which causes a friction with the Avengers at the end of the day. So there is this strategic advantage that they could have if a Secret Wars movie was split into two parts. 
right? So we're talking about Avengers 5 and then Avengers like 6, 7, right? Yeah. And maybe those are only like one year apart, right? Yeah. There's an advantage that you have there is if you introduce a lot of your multiversal variants, which we're already familiar with the term variant now, in that sixth movie, right? You can market test them. Mm -hmm. You put them out there in the world. You see what characters the audience responds to the most. Who do they like? Who do they want to keep around? You kill off all the ones that people didn't like, and you keep the ones around that you like, and you fold them into your new MCU that's rebooted. You know, uh, you can't do that if you if you introduce them all in one movie and then kill them all all at the very end, or you you know not leave, kill leave them, door. But make them non-existent yeah. or something like that. So that is one, and we do know that Marvel uh, does do kind of like their own version of market testing to decide like kind of like their ne next projects and stuff like that. So yeah, that that's one unlikely advantage yeah. of splitting it into two films, right? And I, I think I think um, all these comic book series I've read and they're obviously very comic book tropey you have to adapt them to the things again uh the avengers uh in game and infinity war borrow from a series called infinity written by jonathan hickman which is the precursor to time runs out here so they could lean into that if they wanted to i i'm excited either way but i do love the idea of incursions and i'm glad you rewatched doctor strange to remind me that those do exist and those should be <laughs> literally uh, something that you can't predict and you can't control would be something crazy to think of the Avengers trying to stop, right? Like, how do we mm -hmm. use our minds? How do we use our brawn? It's not working, and it all ends in Battle World somehow. So, highly recommend those. But X-Men, let's get into the X-Men. This is going to be a key factor when the MCU probably relaunches post-Secret uh, Wars, no matter when it is. But Jordan Peele has recently met with Marvel about this movie. This movie was brought up ex specifically the X-Men um, because it, they are looking for somebody high-profile to kick this off, right? And um, everyone's like, is he going to write it or direct it? It's mostly our, our director because we already have a writer in, in the works. Well, also, too, Jordan Peele doesn't strike me as the type of director that doesn't have creative input on the story. Yep. I mean, he this is this is like a weird kind of cross that he in his career that he kind of has to make the decision. Right. Because to me, at least personally, Jordan Peele, the name kind of sits up there with these like Edgar Wrights, these you know, maybe let, you know, to a lesser extent than like a Christopher Nolan, you know, these are mm -hmm. like name directors where no matter what they make, I'm going to go watch it because I don't even need to see a trailer. I know it'll be good on some level. You know, it might not be better than some previous work of theirs, but it'll be good. Like I wasn't a, the biggest, you know, fan of last night in Soho from right, but I, yeah. I still had a good time and I felt like it was worth my admission. So there's a path where that is his career where Jordan Peele could just keep making these like very intriguing, creative movies. Right. Uh, but also I wouldn't blame him if he went the, you know, the big cash yeah. cow. I can do like, I'm one, sure one X-Men could... movie, right? Like I'll do one and see how it works for him. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? Like, and this is the, this is the kind of step that you need to do, right? You can't fumble the ball on rebooting the X-Men. Like this is a franchise that is going to go we've already seen it go for more than a decade. Mm -hmm. They need it to do the same because, uh, the, all of these characters that they've already built in the MCU, they're starting to fray and wither a little bit. Audience interest is starting to, you know, dwindle, not like a ton. It's not a catastrophe, but you know, they need something new. And can you imagine an X-Men poster, with with directed by Jordan Peele right under the uh, logo. I mean, I, come on, that would be huge for Marvel. I, I'm on the other. I, I think it'll bring a lot of people. I don't. I I don't care for Jordan Peele's movies. Don't entice me, but I don't care for horror films, and that's what he leans into recently. So it's not to say that he doesn't do a good job. I just don't lean into horror films. But I do think, as you, you said, he would have. You know, you want to swing. You want someone who's going to come in and put their stamp on something, right? Like like you mentioned, Sam Raimi put his stamp on Doctor Strange, right? You know it's a Raimi film. If you want him to come in and do this, I think Jordan Peele would be the person to come in with a, a idea, something he wants to do, a story. He's The story is being written, but he wants to tell it his take that story and tell it his way. He's got to be on board with that. I think he'd do a fantastic job. And I, I think I disagree. I wouldn't say I disagree. I think my thought process is not like the audience waiting current Marvel movies. Have you seen how popular X-Men 97 has been, Mike? 
um, you can't you can't throw away that X Men goodwill that they just built back up for you this year. If if you ruin X Men on your next go, like there there is no there is no recovering from that. I guess right. Um, you're probably going to end end up with an Eternals on your hands where you have a lot of characters and nowhere to put them because um, you're kind of gun shy at the end of the day. So. Well, we we both we both agree the stakes of no oh absolutely fire. I I, th- I think I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I don't think he, he's a bad choice I just I don't think seeing his name would make me want to do it but I would I would love to see what he would do with it though and you know at the, at mm-hmm. the end of the day so I I would love to to, to do that so I, I think I think he could he could bring something to the table absolutely and um I, even if he doesn't do it you know maybe maybe something else will come out what if what if he does Midnight Suns instead like like the that kind of horror film, like yeah, uh, maybe. So lean, lean into what he does, and um, he's also doing a video game with uh, Hideo Kojima, right? I believe. So, um, so we can see what see what he's doing next. But actually, I think I think I think uh, X Men's got got knocked out of the park, and we we both agree to that. Um, so next thing is uh, someone a, a, a relatively. Um, I wouldn't say positive. What's this? The ratio of successes is higher than most people. Scooper has said for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Phase 7, um, if you want to know what it's going to be about, likely look to the stars, specifically Eternals Volume 3, which is a comic book series. So, First of all, I have to decode just Phase yeah. 7. Yeah. I can't believe that we're already at the point where we're dropping a 7. That's like... what. It took, I can't, I, it took like me we, a while to we, do the math on that even. I was like, oh, are we are we on I, six? I thought we were still in phase four, but I forgot that that ended after Wakanda Forever. So we're yeah. currently in five, and then we gotta, we are not even on to the next one. It's crazy that we're already at that digit already. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. And um, the well, the, the uh, to me, the the next you know thing kind of it wasn't gonna be whiplash, but it's like. Someone saying look to Eternals for for the next phase, and um, Eternals Volume Three. I actually own every book in the series physically um, because it was written by Neil Gaiman uh, as the writer of this uh, the mm-hmm. series, and it's um, kind of kind of an interesting you know tell of um, that people on Earth. I think maybe the Eternals. Um, it might have been other people have forgotten their memories uh and uh they're 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 kind of recovering those memories for like half a million years so i don't know what part of this 12 issue story to pull out of it but i mean that's a that's a wild thing to be throwing out there uh i mean to me that just sounds like there's going to be some sort of mechanism that they build into this world to kind of reboot it right that just what it seems like to me. It, it, it uh, sounds like maybe the, an awakening of, of that universe, I guess, right? Like, hey, we are all mixed match collaborations of other universes coming yeah, to realization. Um, I mean, I'm trying to remember because I'm just trying to think of live action adaptations of kind of like reboots or like kind of mash permanent mashups in a way. And I just keep thinking of that Arrowverse um, crossover Crisis on that Infinite they Earth. did. Yeah, and, but the thing is, I really didn't watch those um, seasons all that much, so I don't really know how it continued on after that. But that ended with all of the you know characters and actors in the same world, and yeah. I believe all of the leads retained their memories of everything that they've been through. But just everyone else, like all of what um, the normal people in that world just kind of like, oh, it's just always been like this. This has always been our world. So, I mean, you kind of have to do that when you're kind of bringing in, like, actors and all of these different TV shows that you've built out separately. Um, Maybe something like that is what's happening. I don't know. Yeah, I I mean, I don't either. It's just just a weird – I mean, we're very early on, obviously. We're not even – we're in Phase 5. Phase 6 doesn't end until the end of next year. So Or Phase – six doesn't start till the end of next year after fantastic four or maybe with fantastic four. I don't know, but like, it's just a weird, um, it's not weird. It's just interesting. It's an interesting series to, to call out in the middle of it. So I'm gonna have to go dust off those issues and read and, and see if it brings up anything. I'm like, Oh, this would be a great, great thing to go. But if anyone, um, sees, um, that out in the world, you can go grab a, uh, grab a, I guess a collection of Eternals volume three while you can. 
All right, I've been waiting to talk to you about it. We have not talked about this at all, people. Uh, but Venom, The Last Dance, got its first trailer earlier this week. And, and we haven't said a word to each other about this. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about it. Because you did, you did exactly what I wanted you to do, Mike. You put <laughs> the Venom horse on our thumbnail. Because I'm like, this has got to be the wildest thing I've ever never dreamed of coming out of a Venom movie. Is that they Venomized a horse. But um, yeah, I, I mean, the 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 trailer gets me excited because it just seems so wacky and just out of pocket and just a fun time with Goo and Tom Hardy. Uh, but I I kind of thought that maybe it would improve with the sequel. So I would be considered what uh, uh, crazy. What, what's the definition they always say? The definition of crazy is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different re- results. Yeah, yeah. So um, I should not be expecting different results, but the this does give me the feeling that they're leaning into the 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 weirdness of the world a little bit more than it, usual. It, it seems to be going into the a little more abstract um, that that I thought it would. Now I think at the end of the day, it's going to come down to. Um, goo versus goo because we see what looks like to be other colored symbiotes or at least symbiotes colored in different lights um which are kind of like what was that um separation anxiety video game we talked about last time uh mm-hmm. talking about the different color symbiotes kind of maybe bonding with um i would say baron mordo but it's not he's not baron mordo uh um she was alleged i can't pronounce his name whatever his name is in this but um you know there's that but i I didn't expect them to throw down a xenophage, uh, an alien that eats symbiotes, um, fighting them in the, in this movie. I thought it would be another literal symbiote rather than a xenophage at the top of this. So I, I was surprised by that. Um, the the horses. Uh, oh, I was going to tell you, Mike. We get to see Doctor Kirk Connors. Did you notice that in in this? Um, no, I didn't. In this, there is a dude with long hair in a van. About you know two minutes into the trailer or so, maybe closer to the end, um, like he's got like a little guitar and like a little little van he's playing, um, hmm. and that is Riss Iphens who played Doctor Kurt Connors in The Amazing Spider Man, and uh, oh, <laughs> they it, obviously this is not set in that universe, but if it is, or if it is you know a, a Sony slash Spider Man parallel universe. Literally, it could be this version's Kurt Connors he runs into out out in the wild. Like, not doing science stuff. Like, maybe he gave up on science. I don't know. Um, they It seems like they're really pulling, like you mentioned, pulling things out of thin air just to make it wild on this journey here. Um, and then also, the other thing, I've seen this this so much, and, and it's boring me to death. Um, it is the, the uh, bar scene. Did you notice that? That's the same dude from the bar as the end of No Way mm-hmm. Home, and they're like, yeah, "Oh, the guy from uh, Danny Danny Rojas from um, Ted Lasso." Yeah, they're like, um, "Oh, and the the lady in this is also from Ted Lasso, I think the the, the scientist lady in this one. She's in there briefly. Um, is it Juno? Not Juno Temple. Maybe it's Juno. Not. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is her. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she's doing this, but they're like, "Oh, well, are they? Is Sony retconning Marvel's Spider Man No Way Home scene?" And I'm going to say no, because obviously he went from one bar, probably went right back to the other bar he was at in his universe and was like, it's the same dude, just a different universe, right? Like, I don't think it, Marvel needs to have the black symbiote. And if they re- if Sony retcons it and Venom the Last Dance, people are going to riot. They're, gonna, they're just going to riot, Mike. That, that's, there's no way to do it. Um, so... If they do that early on in this movie, it's going to just absolutely be destroyed in reviews and everywhere else. But um, overall, I don't know what to expect. It, it does seem like this is the last movie. Like It seems like there's some pretty somber moments in here. Like Venom or Eddie are, gonna, are both going to die at the end of this movie, Mike. Yeah, I'm curious what the plan is for you know Sony after this, right? You know, Do they just keep resurrecting just bizarre one-off spider-man characters just till the end of time uh it seemed like venom was their the most successful attempt that they had out of it and now it's coming to an end so mm-hmm. well there's still craven all, lord knows we got craven later this yeah all eyes on craven i guess um yeah i don't think i don't think sony has a plan other than hey uh, marvel can you make us money with your 
by by doing Spider Man for us. Because yeah, it seems like it, it seems like a company that operates quarter by quarter, right? Yeah. We just want to make sure the next quarter is better than the last one. We're not going to think about it too much. Yeah, we um, yeah, we've not heard anything about a Morbius two, thankfully. Um, you know, Silver and Black was canceled. They they uh, they're not doing the Spider Society move uh, show at, at Amazon anymore. Um, but they are moving forward with Noir with Nicolas Cage. So literally crapshoot, but. This one, I think, was also written by Tom Hardy um, and uh, and Kelly Marcel, uh, who Kelly Marcel wrote the script from a story from her and Hardy, and I think she is also filming it. So um, seems to be a pretty pretty tight crew here. I'm gonna watch it in theaters, but like at the same time, I'm I'm not gonna really go in and expect uh, you know, I'm not expecting top tier quality cinema out of this yeah so. when's this one come out again i've uh, already forgotten. october <laughs> they all come out in october let's see here it doesn't even include yes it just says october in the uh the, the uh description here that's all i have do you yeah is there any other animals you'd want to see venomized after watching the horse i'm like ooh, <laughs> what other animals can we venomize in the in this universe yeah, it seems to be the only way to get me uh, excited. Maybe this is how Craven gets his powers. Uh, that lion that oh yeah, it's magic blood. Him or we saw or the magic blood or... already in the trailer. They're not going to re. Yeah, that. May- maybe that's uh, maybe that's venomized blood. Maybe that's where it came. Yeah, there have been um, well, uh, you know, Spider Man Two had Craven and Venom in it. Uh, I was I was hoping for a venomized Craven. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, the only other thing is you know, there's a scene where uh, Tom Hardy's underwater and being like. Sh- shot by those dudes, the military dudes. So maybe like a venomized fish or shark would be interesting to watch, mm, but that would be or a, ga- a, a gator maybe. Yeah. Yes. A gator with an accent too. Uh, very, very Southern of you, but uh, check out that trailer in our, in our show notes. Uh, moving on, Mike, I've not had a chance to watch the acolyte yet uh, this week with everything kind of going on. Have you, um, have you watched it yet? The star Wars? Yeah. Checked it out last night. Okay. So don't, we'll, we'll probably talk about it on our next one. Cause we'll have, four of the eight episodes under our belt um, or four, at least half of them, but it is now the most watched Disney plus premiere of 2024 with 4.8 million views in five days. Uh, and X-Men was just a uh, 4 million. Um, the X-97 and it's got a 93% on rotten tomatoes uh, comparable to Andor in terms of scores. So, yeah, I, I feel like the only news I've been seeing about this show is the, uh, the review bombing that's been happening. I don't, I didn't really look into it. I didn't want to waste my time trying to figure out what counterculture doesn't like something that's happening in this show. The only thing I can say about after watching two episodes of this show is there is, there's nothing in these two episodes so far to come to a definitive opinion either way. Yeah. Uh, I, I, if I had to criticize it in any way, I would just say like, oh, I feel like the kind of the show hasn't quite gotten on the road just mm-hmm. yet, but I don't know how anyone could draw huge praise or huge negativity just from the sample of these two episodes that we've gotten so far. So if you're somebody that's motivated by reviews in any way, well, I mean, the, I, uh, I wouldn't really know what to tell you. Yeah, the ninety three percent. I think it's the first four episodes. I think where the critics got to review the first four. But uh, I would still say I what you mentioned is the same way I felt about really watching Andor. Like it took three episodes to get that show going. If you remember, like first first two were like yeah okay not bad, but the third was like all right we're off. So I'm excited to see you know if this is getting the same critic reviews after four episodes that Andor did. We could do that. But I would say on the other side the the uh, negative reviews are literally brand new accounts with. Um, literally the same uh the same content over and over again it, it's pretty pretty sad to kind of see that on there um to to do that you'd think they'd have some sort of system to work on that like hey this is the same content copied and pasted over and over again but yeah isn't this what ai is supposed to be doing can't ai recognize just very obvious like I, oh this account was just made uh yeah. the the quality of the review is just low. It's like one sentence, you know, like, right. right. Just, yeah. Well, <laughs> it, well, exactly. It's, it's, you know, so many days old and this is what you came here and reviewed. And it's the same thing. Somebody else posted, you know, two minutes ago on another account. So, um, but I'm excited to watch it. I, I just haven't had, had time to sit down and, and, and give it the full attention. It works. So, uh, we'll probably, uh, 
talk more about it here uh, in two weeks. Mike, I wasn't going to include this news here, but this is uh, this is true to our title of our show, the superhero slate. And the slate for Superman, the movie, has been revealed. And it looks to be, I don't know if this is like someone's collection that they have, that they're keeping, like a personal collection or like a, a museum or like where this is. But this is the, uh, the slate for the Superman movie with James Gunn. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what the decorative artistic element is on the bottom of it. Like. Yep. It seems to be abstract at first, but then it makes me think, oh, is this like a crop of maybe like some visual development for the it's, movie? Like it's a is mirror this some sort of like if you look at it. Like like is it some like Kryptonian architecture and like the ba- I don't really know what what it is anyway, but it's colorful. <laughs> yeah. It's um it's got again, obviously the big thing is the S right down the middle. I don't know like I thought all slates had that digital timer on them. Like instead of the um, the the dry erase feature these days, so it's interesting to see like a, a literally a clapboard, if you will, of this nature that doesn't have the digital screen on it. Um, yeah, who knows? Who knows? Maybe this is like a um, like the, more of a vanity slate, if the, you will. The inaugural like, one the, they use it for the first yeah, and I mean, the last kind of thing. Yeah, something like that. Like the big scissors when you when you cut open a, a yeah. new building or something. Yeah. But yeah, you get the big Kingdom Come inspired logo. You see the red, blue, and black to lean into it. Uh, like I said, I, the design is essentially a mirror left and right if you cut it down the middle uh, other than the Superman logo. So um, that might give to the duality, Mike, that we've talked about there being like an Ultraman, a clone of Superman he has to fight in this universe. Maybe that's what it's leaning into. Hmm. Um, I don't know either, but I thought it was cool because obviously that is our show is called Superhero Slate. And we had a slate to talk about for the first time, I think, in 10 years of doing the show. So <laughs> check that out. And lastly, uh, we're going to talk about the upcoming the trailer release for the upcoming horror film Alien Romulus, uh, directed by Fede Alvarez, who's done um, was it Don't Breathe and uh, 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 Evil Dead 2013. Um, this movie is set between Alien and Aliens, Mike. So this is a, a, in between of the first two movies. And boy, does it uh, lean into homaging those first two films quite a bit. Yeah. I watched this trailer and it felt like, Oh, this is the equivalent of like a next gen update for a video game. You know, uh, we know dead space. The game is heavily inspired by the alien movie franchise and dead space did this very thing where they had like a, a next gen re-release of the original game. So like the trailer, the way the, um, the alien logo is revealed kind of like bit by bit at the very end. Um, it's the, the content seems to be similar of people stuck on a ship. And then we really, the only thing we get to see are the, the little, um, what, what do they call like the alien, the face huggers? That's right. Uh, we just get super, super quick glimpses of the actual xenomorph, and then I think I they they showed one actor that, who was like very stoic and kind of um, computery, and I bet yeah. like oh that's probably the uh, the android of the crew. Yeah. Um, so I mean it it looks this looks cool, right? Yeah. We do the one thing we do know about it was it was originally supposed to be like a Hulu movie, and then it got promoted to the big screen. So I'm expecting a, a little bit of a smaller story, but some of the visuals looked really cool too. There are some cool exterior shots of like the ship kind of going through like, you know, debris and space that looked pretty polished. So I wonder if maybe the move from, so, you know, so small screen, the big screen that had uh, some time to polish some stuff. I, I, don't know. I actually think you're confusing. There's an alien TV series coming to Hulu. still. um, Co- I think covenant was made for, for Fox by Fox to be a, a, a movie. Only you mean you mean Romulus or Romulus? Sorry, yeah, sorry, Romulus. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I was looking at the other one. So I think Romulus is made to be a uh, to be a, a movie. I don't think it was the Hulu. I think the Hulu thing's a different one uh, still coming. Um, I have to I'll have to pull it up. But what I like I, again, there's the blood, there's the horror, there's you know there there are a lot of scenes you see like the, the pulse rifles. You get to see the interior, of the ships, and stuff like that. But I think this one is like they go up to a ship and find a ship that is up there, and it might be tied into. What was it? Alien Covenant. Um, the, the robot David's put a lot of those um, samples of, of aliens and facehuggers in like little capsules. 
So what if they're mm-hmm. like on this ship and that's where they find them years later, decades later, because it's you know decades after that, uh, and then kind of unleash them because it looks like one of them came out of like a like a little uh, goo pod at one point rather than like an egg. Like maybe they've been incubated mm. there. So I expect to see some twists and turns in this. Uh, obviously, it's got the R rated. Uh, I love the like it looked like a like a light. Someone was shining through their chest before that chest burster burst out of them. Oh kind yeah, of thing. that was cool. So I really looking forward to them leaning into the. Um, the body horror that is aliens. And there's one scene at the end you got to see. Um, literally, it's a, I think it's when the, the, the trailer goes silent. The main character, she's floating towards green like goo in space and zero gravity. And that's like the alien blood, like the acid blood. So like, could you imagine the horror of being in zero gravity floating towards the alien blood? Like the, oh, that would eat yeah. you alive. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like they're going to get creative with this. I, 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 really, I really enjoyed it. Um, it's so much I even went and like watched a breakdown video afterwards. I'm like, tell me more about aliens, like, because I don't, <laughs> I don't, I've seen the movies, but I don't live in the alien universe. So I'm like, tell me more about this. Like, I want to know more about how this fits in here. So uh, let's go out August 16th. But I'm, I'm excited to check that out. Uh, this, this uh, late summer, I guess, when it comes out. Um, Mike, that's the episode this week. Anything else before we sign off for two weeks? No, I mean, I'm looking forward to you coming out to visit me, Chris. Uh, hopefully people, our loyal listeners, will be happy that we will be recharging at a heavily IP-based theme park. Yes. We'll come back in two weeks and let you know what our what our adventure was like. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for that. But if people want to know what you're up to in the meantime, where can they find you at? Yeah, they can find my web comics at liferewardsrisk.com and pickledcomics.com. Chris, if people want to catch up with you, where can they find you? You can find me on Instagram, Valdan87, V-A-L-D-A-N, or Video Game Systems, the same name. If people want to know more about the show, what we're doing, where they can come back in two weeks, find all our good stuff, or listen to it while we're gone, where can they get that content? As always, you just got to visit SuperheroSlate.com. That's the best place to find all the avenues we host our show and to get our show notes. If you want to check out any of these trailers that we talked about today, we got that in our show notes. Uh, You can find us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, wherever else you love to listen to. Find podcasts like our own. Uh, You can get merch at SuperheroSlate.com slash store. Uh, We love hearing from you. Let us know. What did you think about that Venom trailer? What did you think about that Alien trailer? And we love our super fans. If you want to be a super fan of this show, it's so easy. All you have to do is share the show with a friend, share the show with a buddy, and we will be here almost every week, folks. That's right. See you in two. We will see you in two weeks. Bye.